Abish Kikilbaev, a mysterious, controversial and interesting personality. One can find numerous high positions in his biography. But there was another Kikilbaev, a gifted writer, master of the word, exemplary figure from many modern writers. This was a different facet of his personality, and maybe even the primary one. Biknur Kisikov, writer, author of numerous novels, stories and poems, member of Jury of Literature Contest, inspirer and organizer of Kitab Fest Festival, founder of Kazakhstan Encyclopedia Project, encyclopedia.kz. Kikilbaev's old friend, a translator and writer, Harold Bilger, once said, he could have become a giant like Mukhtar Oezov, but his second wife, politics deprived us of all of his unwritten books. Although he was right, it turns out that the most genuine talent cannot be spoiled by politics. Even being a highly positioned government official, Kikilbaev has never ceased to create his masterpieces. Abish Kikilbaevich Kikilbaev was a Kazakh public and political figure, hero of labor, people's writer of Kazakhstan, laureate of the state prize, philologist, member of the Academy of Social Sciences, honorary professor of Al-Farabi Kazakh National University and Gumilyov Eurasian National University. And the man has been holding some very high posts indeed. Starting from the position of a regular newspaper employee, he was able to rise to the position of a deputy minister of culture of the Kazakh SSR. Later, he worked as a chairman of the Supreme Council, state secretary, and has even been a senator. Despite the enormous work pressure, Abish Aga has never betrayed his real calling, literature, and he would show his literary skills at any place he was working. He used to work as the script editor at Kazakh Film. Movies like Kok Sirik, Shot on the Kara Pass, Kiz Jibyek, The End of the Ataman, and many other films of the Kazakh cinema's Golden Fund bear the imprint of Kikilbaev's talent. By the way, did you know that while Kikilbaev worked as a deputy minister of culture, he had a hand in the construction of the Central State Museum of the Republic of Kazakhstan, as well as the Central Concert Hall and some other remarkable architectural edifices in Almaty. Indeed, sometimes we have no idea to whom we owe certain works of art. In the period from July 1988 to November 1989, Abish Kekilbaevich served as the chairman of the Presidium of the Central Council of the Kazakh Society for the Protection of Monuments of History and Culture, and headed the Department of International Relations of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Kazakhstan. It was due to his knowledge and efforts that such profound projects like Turkestan, Sairam, Otrar, Mangistau, Shubartau, and Ayrtau gained worldwide fame. They were included in the route of the Silk Road expedition organized with the support of UNESCO. Kikilbaev was not merely a Kazakh talent, he truly was a global phenomenon. Twice he was elected as the member of the board of the Union of Writers of the USSR. Also, he has always been invited to judge at various international literature contests. Kikilbaev wasn't simply read by the public. People were in love with his works. Everyone loved his books, his friends, his colleagues, his students. Some of them later have become contemporary writers. His novels, The Well and The Q, have raised the bar of the literary mastery of Kazakh prose to the level of the greatest writers of modern literature. Kafka, Sartre, Frisch, Kobo Abe, and the others. Not many people are aware of the fact that Abish Kikilbaev was the first person to introduce the word mankurt in his story called the Q. As we know, many have attributed the term to Chinggis Aitmatov and his book, The Day Last More Than a Hundred Years. But Aitmatov's book was written in 1980, whereas the Q was written 12 years prior. 
However, that wasn't a topic for discussion, even for the authors themselves, as they respected each other and were close friends. The Ke is considered as one of the most mysterious and well-written works of Abish Kikilbaev. It is filled with symbolism of the time and reflects some deep psychological tension of the protagonist. So what does the story tell us about? The story introduces us to a geodesist called Sirim. He arrives at Mangistau Desert in order to map some topographic objects. He meets an old man from a local Turkmen tribe called Kurban. Kurban, who is playing the national instrument Dutar, draws Sirim's attention. The geodesist asks the old man to perform something special. Kurban starts playing an ancient melody so magical that it bends the reality. It dissolves and Sirim starts seeing the pictures of the past. Harsh Turkmen warriors appear in front of Sirim. They have just captured six young men from the Kazakh Adai clan and prepare them for some kind of ritual. The leader of the Turkmens, Jonit, gloomily observes the preparations. His brother-in-arms, Mambet Pana, is standing next to him, filled with anger. Each of them has their own questions to the Kazakhs, especially to their worst enemy, the destroyer of the Turkmen villages, Duim Kara. In the meantime, Turkmen warriors skinned a camel and cut its hide into many pieces. Then they shaved the heads of their captives and covered them with the camel's skin. And without loosening the bonds, they leave poor men under the sun. After some time, the skin is glued to the heads of the captives. Their hair gets ingrown. Days pass. Excruciating pain drives the captives mad. They forget their names, their clans, and where they come from. They now become Mankurts, who don't remember their roots. Mankurts are submissive slaves who are only good for performing some household chores. It is an awful lot, isn't it? These two Mankurts are being sent to the Kazakh steppe to demonstrate Duim Kara how the Turkmens can revenge themselves. Revenge is a peculiar and weird thing. Its source can be one person and the result of it can be reflected on the other. One might think what these poor young men have to do with all of these, if Duyim Kara was the villain. But a collective responsibility was something to be considered back then. Once Duyim Kara traveled, and at some point he decided to stay at the yurt of an old Turkmen overnight. The guest who is seeking a shelter for the night is untouchable, even if he is a foe. Duyim Kara knew this and fearlessly stayed in the yurt overnight. The host didn't hurt his guests, but he sent a message about his guest to Turkmen Batir, Kok Bore. In the morning, when Duyim Kara hit the road, Kok Bore caught up with him. Zhik Pia Zhik, let's have a fight, said Kok Bore, and confronted his enemy. And the fight started. Lucky and experienced, Duyim Kara took over his opponent and won. He didn't kill Kok Bore, but decided to bury him alive. It was cruel, even under the laws of a harsh step. The Turkmen started loathing Duyim Kara even more. But was it even possible to capture the villain? In the meantime, Duyim Kara continued to raid Turkmen villages and destroy them. Zhenit's youngest son, musician Daulet, wanted to avenge his people, but was killed too. Since then, Zhenit's thoughts were all about revenge. Once his warriors brought him a captive, who was an unusual prisoner. He was independent and fearless and held his head up high. Is this a payback for Daulet? Who is this lunatic? Zhenit was thinking. The warriors brought a musical instrument to the captive. 
He carefully took his dombra and gently bent it over it, just like mother bends over her baby. Shaniyat continued to stare at the man in bewilderment. And finally the prisoners gently touched the strings and started to play. Quietly at first and then speeding up the tempo more and more. Gradually he has filled the whole room with his music mesmerizing the people around him. Even Jeuniet himself was charmed with the melody. Something strange was happening to him. His revenge thoughts were fading, nothing was important anymore. He had no more reasons for hatred. The life was so short. The melody charmed the leader, changing the course of his thoughts. But at some point he pulled himself together. He thought that no matter how talented the young man was, he still was an enemy. And his death would be a decent payback for everything his tribesmen did. Jonit buried the captive in the desert, exactly the same way Duyim Kara buried Kokpore. The warriors who accompanied their leader shuddered. The musician wasn't a warrior, he was an Akin. As gifted as Jonit's late son, Daulet, what was the reason for this unprecedented cruelty? The Turkmens were shaken. Indeed, Jonit had all rights to avenge, but not in a way he did it. As a result, all tribesmen turn away from Jonit. Even his friends stop visiting him. And Jonit himself is losing his peace of mind. He often dreams of the captive that was killed by him. Worn out by constant nightmares, he retires into himself. One day Jonit decides to visit his old friend, Anna Dur. Once he enters Anna Dur's place, he sees his son Kurban playing the dutar, the exact instrument that once belonged to Jonit's son Daulet. He is playing the very melody the captive musician was playing. The melody that once charmed everyone. Jonit uttered a cry of bewilderment, fell down and died. And Sidim is slowly coming back to the reality. He recognizes the boy in Kurban and hears the exact melody he heard in his mirage. As a famous writer and critic, Zira Naurizbaeva mentioned in her article the story was based on a true historical episode. When Adai Kushi Abul was captured by the Turkmens, as a matter of fact, the Turkmens, charmed by his music, set Abul free. Based on this story, a film, Kek, was made by a Kazakh director, Damir Manabaev. The plot was made more cinematic and it reminds of Romeo and Juliet. However, it didn't make it less interesting. A famous writer, Smagul Ilubai, a colleague and admirer of Kikilbaev's father, has written the movie script. At a first glance, one might think that the Q is the story about revenge, about how meaningless and merciless the revenge can be. But it is only one side of the story. In my opinion, the Q is a genuine reflection of the spirit of the Kazakh people, a bond that links the past and the present.